and uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the annual NISMIA conference, New York State Marine Education Association. Our annual conference this year, our theme is Bridging Connections to Water. And um, we're really excited to be making our first presentation in the workshop strand for being hands-on uh, activities for marine science here. Uh, so I'm Maggie Flanagan with the Waterfront Alliance. We'll be making the first workshop in this series of um, panel presentations and we'll be followed by NYC H2O and Kingsborough Community College. Um, we'll also be adding great ideas that can be used for hands-on activities um, with students, families, distance, remote. I think everybody's trying to do it all these days. Welcome everybody, welcome. And uh, if you um, uh, have a sheet of paper and a pencil handy, any colored pencils or markers that might be handy, feel free to run off screen and grab them real quick for our activity this morning. And I'll let my uh, co-presenter Jake introduce himself next. Um, uh, so my name is Jake. I'm the program associate here at Waterfront Alliance. I kind of do anything ranging from education to teaching with Maggie to kind of helping with like technical support and all the conferences and symposiums that we do, which is what I'll be doing today. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure, pleasure to see everyone. Great. Thank you all. Um, uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I, I would love to keep us moving, but I, I, I really appreciate everyone being here today. So if you'd just like to I, you know, say your name and identify the area of education you work in um, or something like that really quickly, I think that will also help our Q&A be more rich as we go through our workshop. Um, and maybe I could just kind of call on folks on my screen in uh, clockwise order. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Richards. I am finishing my 34th year of teaching at St. Anne's School in Brooklyn. Uh, the school goes pre-K through 12th grade. I teach middle school and high school science, all water-based themes. I, this year in high school, I'm teaching um, oceanography in the fall and I'm finishing up my meteorology course in the spring. Um, and I am uh, the treasurer of NISMIA as well as the conference coordinator. Thanks. Thanks, Laurel. Hi, I'm Laurel. Um, I am an informal educator at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, I have a background in marine biology, so I used to teach a lot about coral reef conservation down in Florida, but in New York, um, I really focus on education around the Hudson, the widest age ranges. So I've worked with students that are um, little daisy scouts that are like four and five years old, all the way up to undergrad. And, um, and then we also teach a lot about climate change and sea level rise as well. And for um, Williams Ocean, would you like to introduce yourself? No, that's okay. That's Getting Lee, oh. Lee Williams. Yes, yeah, who's um, our NISMIA member with us, right? And hopefully getting her paper and pencil. <laughs> Excellent. To start, I'd like to just share a quick PowerPoint um, of resources that we prepared at Waterfront Alliance. Uh, that support um, hands-on uh, activities for marine science that, as I was saying, can be done in the classroom, at home, uh, with everyone is trying to build their skills in this new area of education. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, try to share screen. And uh, how are you folks doing? Is it working on your side? Yeah. Yep, looks great, Maggie. Yeah, looks good. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to um, proceed pretty quickly through the slides here because um, all of this information is on the Waterfront Alliance website. So we just kind of want to do a very high level scan of what you might find there that supports these activities. Our Waterfront Alliance mission to have resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. Now it's not advancing. There we go. Uh, here's the official wording of our vision. I like to say we want the best of everything on the waterfront, you know, recreation, um, uh, working waterfront, uh, education. Of course, you all know this, so I'll skip pretty quickly through some of uh, these slides. Um, but all of this information is on our website to enable teachers to download and use as is helpful for them or to bring us in and help them with it. Uh, one thing I just want to point out about, about the image here, I like this image from the Army Corps of Engineers because it 
really identifies the many component waterways of our estuary. But the, um, this one little line here, if you can see my mouse, uh, is non-existent at this point. That is the proposed uh, giant flood seagate um, between the Rockaways and New Jersey. Um, that doesn't exist yet, but it is also that um, kind of imaginary jurisdiction between the ocean and the inland waters, which of course is actually mixing, as we all know, um, as uh, folks who work in marine education about the estuary. Um, water quality has been greatly improving, um, but CSOs are a big problem we're working on. Um, uh, if folks are not aware, um, you can find plenty of this information on our website or on other resources about how sometimes sewage water due to heavy rain is raw sewage is released into our waterways still. All of those um, great efforts have resulted in all of the revitalization we're celebrating now, as you can see here. Um, you, again, you all know this as well, um, but for educating our students, all of this background is available on the website. Um, all of this uh, on our website comes with this Coastal Resilience Education Toolkit, the seven interactive activities as I, I said, are very flexible and adaptable. It can be done in classrooms, in a lab, at home, uh, are there with full descriptions as well as pre and post activities. Um, so you can pick and choose from that menu as a teacher. And uh, that also allows Waterfront Alliance to really have a great model to support education in schools through residencies between our seven main activities and their pre and post activities. Um, we're available to support hands-on marine science in schools in any number of weeks of a package that works with the school schedule. Uh, the Mystery of the Disappearing Shells is an activity you'll have to read about. We're not doing it today, but a great illustration of ocean acidification, which is a chemical change in the oceans brought on by climate change. The calcium carbonate of a basic eggshell is chemically very comparable to the shells of marine creatures. So by watching the eggshell dissolve in vinegar, um, you can really have a significant visual that connects the concepts of ocean acidification for your students. Um, it can take about three days, I would say. You'll find the instructions. Um, we have a great game where we've developed all of the game cards. I love educational games. Um, there are games. Oh, Jake, please describe the human impacts game. Jake's been our expert about it. Yeah, I would love to. Um, so this is actually the first game and activity in the Coastal Resilience Education Toolkit. And it's really just like providing uh, like a base to understanding estuaries, especially around like the New York, New Jersey Harbor estuary. And it, it's adapted for either kids from grades three to six or seven through 12 with the, the cards that we have. And essentially it's a game where you have cards and you have like a bowl or something that will serve as your estuary. And then kind of something like a game token that'll be like, we usually use like goldfish to represent that. And so those will be fish in the estuary. And so you'll draw a card and it'll say, you know, a heron or a shorebird eats a fish for lunch, take out one fish and you take out one fish from the estuary and put it to the side or eat it. Um, and yeah, just proceed that way. And each, each card will kind of provide like something like, you know, you and your family go on a fishing boat trip, choose how many fish to take out, or it could be something from like an oil spill has occurred in the harbor, or you've had like an arts festival, like along the shoreline that dumped a bunch of paint, like remove these fish. And this is really just to provide like, understanding of like the impacts that humans have had on the estuary and can have, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, but by, by pulling the cards, the students are, are um, getting a real understanding and education about that. Thank you, thank you, Jake. Um, and we've been playing the game remotely, uh, using chat for the answer, or kids can unmute themselves. Uh, so it all works really flexibly. Um, we talked about the shelves. Um, water quality at home is are some great activities where Jake made these videos as well. To, um, everything in our toolkit tries to use the simplest materials possible. We know how kind of the logistics behind a hands-on activity can add challenge and stress to the um, 
educator or teacher's job. Um, so um, Jake was able to develop these activities with simple materials like clay, a straw, a ruler, um, where you can still really um, get hands-on to, uh, to anchor science concepts in some real world experiences. Um, Become an ecological engineer is a tray of water based activity that you'll also find in our toolkit. Uh, and the next set of slides are presented on our website as a PowerPoint and workbook uh, that you can use with students in companion with our toolkit. Um, I'm sure again in our audience here, many of us know these um, facts on the side. Um, uh, so I won't be reading all the text, but particularly since a picture is worth a thousand words, we wanted to make sure we were including images that would really help students understand why their observations about a melting eggshell or, you know, what happens when you make waves in a tray of water, why it all really matters and, and how can we be, um, get involved to ensure a better future and for older students to really bring in that civic engagement. Um, that the students can be activated as citizens to help face climate change as well. So um, this, uh, this next set of slides is available for download from our website um, because it's not just the data. You don't need numbers to see it. You can see these effects with your eyes. Um, there's many maps uh, available that will show you both flooding and the effect of flooding on sea level rise. Um, the definition of resilient, as you can see here, is quite a kind of wordy, big concept. So again, we're providing activities and images that really help students grasp what that all means. Um, we're going to, again, connecting it to governments and how citizens can work, advocate with their governments um, to, to address these issues, uh, images of, of if you're advocating for how to address these issues, what does it really mean? Um, we are, our post activities particularly help students connect with the societal and governmental policies that are behind some of these challenges. And we love to talk about green infrastructure. That's some of the activity we'll be doing today. And so we, uh, green infrastructure uses the processes of nature to help manage uh, things that need to be managed in our environment, like rainwater, heat, things like that. And again, you see many, we provide many visual examples so students can understand that. Hard infrastructure or gray infrastructure is sometimes necessary. And we also acknowledge that social infrastructure, that ensuring that a community is heard and their needs are being met through the processes of resilience is very important. Uh, so again, we can find what you can do and how Waterfront Alliance can help. So, um, thank you all for letting me share some of that background information. And as we go through the set of workshops today, um, and I can uh, catch up with typing, uh, Jake and I will be posting um, the link into the chat for you all. Uh, so you can access our website even more easily. So um, we also have an activity in the website that I'd love to try with you called Neighborhood Water Budget. So in the end, just to, since we need to move quickly, I'll show you, I did a couple of examples. This is my blocks neighborhood water budget. It might be hard to see. <laughs> um, oh, it is, I'm sorry. It's my drawing and pencil uh, of my house with what's green and what's concrete or asphalt around it. Um, you can also do it neighborhood wide. This is my neighborhood wide one, you can see it, with water on it. And um, we'll fold the paper to create a chart and then um, use a numbering system based on percentages to give ourselves a score for how um, the, our green infrastructure works in our neighborhood. And if your students are old enough, um, the vocabulary of permeable surfaces and impermeable surfaces really matters here um, as well. Uh, so I'm sure you all know when it, it, when it rains on hard surfaces, you get even more flooding. And when it rains on absorptive surfaces, you're taking advantage of those green infrastructure items. And that effect doesn't just happen at the waterfront. Even if you're blocks away from the waterfront, your green infrastructure and your neighborhood water budget actually matters to coastal resilience during storms and flooding events. So if you all would like to get your paper and sketch your own little, and I'll use a pen now since my is easy. 
Um, you can choose to select your block or a stretch of neighborhood that you have. Um, I, I advise folks for, um, I have found that for simplicity, uh, things like sidewalks and streets are almost best to kind of leave white and leave it the negative space. I wouldn't want to um, impose uh, art uh, rules on students too much, but if that's a, a tip you can give them if you like. And uh, go ahead and draw out. Uh, I'll do my block again in pen so you might see it. Uh, are you going to do your block or your waterfront, uh, Sarah? <laughs> I'm doing my block and I'm trying to remember where the tree pits are. I think there's one to the exactly. left and one up the block exactly. pit. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what we'll get to. What I love about this activity is um, particularly, you know, developmentally with younger kids, you can start at your block and then maybe move to your local waterfront because that community connection that, you know, my place in the world sense of place connection is particularly important um, with younger students um, in a developmental approach to education. So I started by putting my block, my, the buildings there, as you can see. <laughs> and then if you um, add, uh, sketch out your buildings, then you can add the green spaces that you know, if there are any um, gardens, parks, um, that kind of thing. And Maggie, this would be a great activity to do like on a, on a very short field trip, <laughs> take your, your mm -hmm. kids out on a walk. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you can even like pace it out so you get a little bit of measuring going on and to scale, that would be good. Yes, I was, um, it says that in our toolkit, I put it on the side here, okay. but um, you can get as math heavy uh, yeah. as you'd like mm -hmm. um, in this activity. Um, and so it can be done quickly as a field trip or it can be done, um, you know, over several lessons where you're setting up a scale and the students are getting heavy in, into the math, if that's a goal in your own curriculum mm -hmm. as well. Um, so don't forget the tree pits and the gardens. And um, I, I've, I've selected with you all now to do the activity um, less informally with less math um, because it enables us to get into um, some of the vocabulary quickly as well, um, that uh, the, um, uh, as, as our world is responding to this, these needs for flood control and water management, they're creating things like permeable pavers and permeable surface um, asphalt and things like that. There are ways that you can still have a sidewalk, but it is more permeable to help manage stormwater, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, bringing in that vocabulary or even after the students are done saying what could be done to improve the permeability here. So I've got my trees and my buildings. I am lucky we have gardens in front and back of mine, definitely. Could, um, does anybody else have one they wanna share and show? Have you tried it? I can share mine, although it's on yellow paper so you might not be able to see it as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so I live on a pier and um our roof has green space on top. Um and then I mean I live in Weehawken. It's a very like urban area. They have planter boxes and like a small grassy patch, but really um it's it's very hardscaped and they're just, you know, the whole area going right into Hoboken is lined with seawall. Um, they, we do have like a small beach, but it's like way down this way. Um, but then all this is water. <laughs> so I don't know how well I, I score in this activity. Great. We're going to find that out next. We okay. <laughs> Would anyone else like to share um, theirs? It'd be great to see uh, a couple. If we could. I know we're doing a quick one. So nobody's getting graded on their artistic prowess here. <laughs> Maggie, yeah, I like the idea that if you do this with your students at the beginning of the year, you could actually follow it up in places you go with them and thinking ahead to when we can do field trips again while we're waiting for the bus or something like that, having them quickly sketch out what's, the, what's it like here compared to where we go to school or where we live, because they'll have already talked about this uh, you're doing right now. So it would be fresh in their minds. It'd be neat to compare different places. How did this place 
make it green. Yes, yes. To do it over time would really enable that. All right, why don't we do the next step? I I do a folding trick to divide up the grid on uh, the paper um, to enable us to kind of get a green infrastructure score. Uh, But as you guys are saying, there are many, many ways to try to um, do this activity. Uh, But uh, based off simple power of 10 math, if you fold your paper like in half the long way, like this, and, and then take each side and fold it into the middle so that the empty space in the middle is about the same width of the two the other two sides. It's about two inches you're looking at in the middle. Again, you, you could use a graph paper and ruler to make the math completely accurate, but you can do it this way and, and still learn from it, most definitely. So it's kind of gonna look like this. Now take your two wings and on, on where they meet, just fold that back. That'll give you another crease. Go back to where my wings were in case anybody's not caught up. So you're along, fold in the sides to the middle, then fold back. And by doing that, you'll have created a two by five grid so we can work off our base 10 to make things. Um, uh, there should be a total of 10 little pre, you know, 10 little boxes when you have that. And then you can assign yourself and uh, infrastructure score between zero and 10 in each box for how much green there is. If I hold this closer, you might be able to see how I did mine there. And in my neighborhood, sadly, uh, it was it came out to be 19. And since we've been working in power of 10, it's easy math to say you know, 19 or 19% on this one. Uh, just for fun, I uh, tried to do an image of the Hunter's Point South. Maybe I could get it closer for you guys. Uh, where um, Hunter's Point South has a lot of resiliency features built into the park next to the new apartment buildings. So by my estimate, they got a 44%, 44% for that. Um, would anyone else like to uh, share? We're going to be running out of time. I apologize. If you want to make a quick estimate on your own um, sheet, uh, let me know. Sarah or Jake, did you want to add anything? Because I know you were busy uh, drawing as well. Well, I didn't draw. I didn't fill up my whole paper, but you know, I live in a very urban area of Brooklyn. I, I'm looking out my window. There's there are trees out front, so we have a couple of trees, but percentage wise. And I didn't really draw it to scale. So I didn't really fill up my whole space. <laughs> yes, my yes. guess would be less than 10%. Wow. <laughs> <It's> permeable. <laughs> Jake, would you like to hear? I was not able to finish it, but I did draw a map. Of course, oh. I messed up here because I was definitely that kid in school who would get a little unfocused. But I have a little bit of green space around where I live. I live kind of in a spot where like a lot of trees meet an area that basically has no trees for like three blocks. Um, so probably not a super high score, um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I have. <laughs> um, Wonderful. Yeah. Um, we're, uh, we're in our question, uh, we're approaching our question period now, but if I could just share a screen with you all one more time, uh, since we want to increase education about green infrastructure, I was able to capture some photos of the um, Hunter's Point South project, which is um, what we call wedge certified at Waterfront Alliance. Um, Art Jake and I have colleagues who work with developers and designers on, um, on these kinds of issues. Are you all seeing a kind of peninsula that's under development? Great. Yeah, we can see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it. This photo is a bit old. There are now uh, towers going up in the footprints where you would expect to see buildings. Uh, but um, they particularly are, they're very proud and should be that this whole part of the park and the walkway that where my mouse is tracing, if you can see it, is actually a parkland designed to be marshland. It's designed to be flooded. That is actually water that comes in there. And uh, that it provides flood protection for the buildings that are being built up here 
because as marine educators, you all know the wetlands can act as a sponge to help absorb and slow the effects of storm surges, flooding rains, things like that. And in addition, in this property, as you go up from the water's edge up towards the buildings, um, it's raised and terraced in a way that anticipates um, climate change and sea level rise so that as the sea level rises, the some of the marshland will be fully underwater, but some of the more elevated green space will become the future marshland. It allows the marshland to migrate with climate change as well. Um, so there are a number of projects around the city that are coming up with these creative uh, approaches to green infrastructure. And you can find additional information about that on Waterfront Alliance's website or contact Jake and I um, to help folks understand about educating for coastal resilience um, through these activities. And, uh, thank you. And I think we have just a couple minutes if there are any uh, questions. Thanks, Maggie and Jake. That was great. Thank you. Laurel asked where that location was. Was it, did you say Hunts Point? Oh, that one is Hunter's Point. So it's uh, Long Island City, Queens. Okay. Uh, the developments there. Um, uh, they've tried similar treatments. Um, Brooklyn Bridge Park has some similar ones if you'd like to um, visit with folks. Uh, and um, on the Harlem River, the state, uh, Roberto Clemente State Park um, also has. Uh, an interesting thing that uh, Jake and I hear from our colleagues in the Wedge program is that the folks who design the marshlands are also very interested in designing the pathways or how the students will observe the marshland um, because they can become trampled, like they, it, they you know, the um, they can become loved too much by uh, using the waterfront. And um, so, um, in all of these sites, they have also thought carefully thought about how they can be used for education without destroying the, the nature-based restoration that um, they're trying to instill. If I could ask a small favor, everyone, whoever made a map, would you mind just holding it up so we could get a quick <laughs> screenshot? <laughs> Thank you so oh, much. No. My artwork, it's um, not my best. <laughs> I know, I'll hold mine up like this. Okay, let me see. Yeah, you can hold it to the side of your face. Perfect. Let me just get one more. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jake, great call. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. Great call. Perfect. Um, all right. Um, I just wanted to say I love this activity and I love getting students to think about their neighborhood and, and taking that pen to paper. Uh, and you could also like expand this activity in um, putting it into Google Earth and looking at other places around the world. And they have a measuring tool and you can create different geometric shapes over laying over the green spaces. So you could get like an area. So that might be fun too. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to, uh, when we do a next set of edits on our toolkit, we might put your tip in there about the Google Earth and the measuring. Because, um, you know, educators, we all, um, are building on the great ideas and work of our colleagues, I find. So thank oh, you so much. Of course. Great. I also think it would be a good extra credit assignment if, uh, when students are going away on vacation or something like that, making one to compare to theirs wherever they're staying and see how they've incorporated their green space. That's a good idea. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah, they, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Can thank I, thank I, you so much for this. It's very helpful. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. And um, uh, we'll wrap up our um, Waterfront Alliance presentation on the Coastal Resilience Education Toolkit now. And we have uh, Jonathan with us from NYC H2O with a great presentation on horseshoe crabs. Jonathan, um, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself and your activity? Oh, and um, we need Jake, we need to make Jonathan co host. If you could, please. Yes, please. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan Turer. I'm an informal educator with NYC H2O. Um, I've been with them over six years now, but I've been doing informal ecology education for about 30 years now. I just was figuring that out. Um, and one of the exciting things that we do in terms of uh, talking about horseshoe crabs is we lead or have been leading up until obviously this year, we've been leading field trips 
uh, primarily to Plum Beach. And we actually do student field trips to Plum Beach. And we also do um, public walks, uh, which include, I, you know, one of the people who signed up for today's conference is Alan Asher. And uh, Alan comes uh, to some of those field trips uh, and helps with education as well. We normally get really big crowds there um, come late May and early June. Um, one of the things, once we get to, uh, let's see if I can screen share. Uh, Jay, oh, I think I can just, share. I'm sorry, Jonathan, I'm working on it. Okay. I think I see the button. Well, let me, well, in any case. Um, there you go, Jonathan, you should be set now. I, oh, I fantastic, that. fantastic. So one of the things, I mean, for us, um, all of our focus was really on the, uh, the kind of the hands-on experience in the uh, kind of in situ. Uh, and so some of the stuff that we were always excited to do uh, was to bring along some of these, um, these molts. And that for us, I have a little, I have a collection of these molts it's a little tricky. I'm borrowing a friend's computer, so I don't want to get the sand on his keyboard. He's going to be really mad at me as much as I try to get the sand out of here. And one of the things that I encourage people to do, especially if you're um, looking to do a little bit of this um, collecting uh, of the molts is to look, I mean, when, when you go on the beach, uh, especially kind of from, um, from May onwards, you're going to find, unfortunately, lots of bodies. Um, but the molts are, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, uh, the molts are completely free of, of any bad smelling stuff. Um, and the key really is this seam right here, um, because that's where they slip out of the shell. Uh, and one of the most spectacular things about this is they leave behind everything. So you can see every one of the book gills in here, this actually happens to have the, the protective cover pulled back and you can see all the book gills, uh, which is a really um, kind of spectacular example of the physiology of this creature. Um, but it also just makes it really easy because you can, you can see every hair uh, in the mouth here, especially. Uh, so it's really special. It's not that hard to find them, uh, which is the other great thing. If you have your eyes open for the paler shells. Um, and so just like I was showing, I've got uh, this sort of older one. This is maybe getting close to, I don't know, five or six years old, but I've also got some of these smaller ones all the way down to this. I'm really, I'm losing this one. This is uh, probably within those first kind of, maybe within the first year when the horseshoe crab molts uh, six times. So the thing I wanted to do, obviously we've not been able to do any of these uh, live field trips. And so it's been um, pretty difficult for us initially until we decided uh, let's see if this is going to be, oh. all right, I'm having a little bit of an issue here in terms of screen sharing. Give me just a second, I apologize. Well, that's, that's fine, Jonathan. Um, they're great resources at NYCH2I. I've been on your story maps website yes. as well. I so. wanted to show that off a little bit. Let's see if I can. Why don't you go and keep, um, we'll keep chatting while you keep um, looking. Definitely no pressure. We understand technology. Um, uh, even though we've been all been at it uh, for almost a year, for about a year now, you know, <laughs> it still presents challenges. So yeah. mm -hmm. I did not wear it today, but I um, 
do proudly have a, a horseshoe crab pin uh, from a walk that uh, Nismia led uh, many years ago um, to visit uh, the same site that you'll be showing us, Jonathan, at Plum Beach, uh, or, or speaking about it, if it's not that, where um, uh, it's amazing um, with the mating season to see the horseshoe crabs there. Has anyone else ever done that? No? Oh. Sarah, how do, how do we get a new guide for our horseshoe crab walks in the future? <laughs> a new guide um, um, besides Jonathan? Uh, no, no, for the walks um, that, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a Nismia walk that uh, one of the Nismia uh, active members led on the shore. Well, Michael has led some and yeah. Alan Asher has led some. Yeah. yeah. It must've been Alan, must've been Alan. I haven't led for Nismia, but I had coordinated a site for not John Tanacredi's study, but for Matt Sclafani's study out of Cornell Cooperative Extension. So not at Plum Beach, but at Dead Horse, where I had gone out like 12 to 15 times a season and had led the tagging and counting there. So maybe that's something to think about in the future. If yeah. For it or something happy to join in with yeah alan ash has been running walks for uh many years out mm -hmm. to uh to plum beach <clears throat> so jonathan just let us know when you're ready and uh we'll continue to talk horseshoe crabs but feel free to interrupt us when you're ready <laughs> yeah i'm just trying to figure out it looks like i'm un unfortunately i'm not sure what's going on because i'm not able to share the screen it looks like i have a privacy issue let me are you trying to get to the uh, your website because maybe maggie could go to the website oh. yeah actually that might be helpful okay. that might be the easiest thing to do unfortunately okay. i apologize for that good idea i'll give it a try <laughs> so we're nyc h2o dot ORG. Let me make sure it comes up first before I attempt to share. Actually, you know what? Let me give you a even better address. Let me give you NYC H2O hub, H U B dot O R G. Okay. Uh, um, oh, there we go. Okay. Let me see if it will work. All right. Uh, has it um, has the landing page shown up for everyone else? Yep, looks good. Oh, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. If you scroll down, you'll see. So what we started doing, um, we kind of did two things at once, and I think we'll be able to focus on the hub a little bit. Um, but we also do virtual lessons. So if we look down to the coastal ecology collection, you can click that open and say explore. We actually were really lucky that we have two of uh, my colleagues who are pretty well practiced in ArcGIS. And so we started using the ArcGIS story map, uh, story map format to start talking about a lot of different subjects that we normally cover on the field trips. And what we found to be so rewarding about the story map format uh, is that we were actually able to, to pull apart a lot of what we were doing uh, and create sort of different levels of engagement. So normally we would visit Plum Beach. We talk about a number of different aspects of the beach. And of course we talk about horseshoe crabs, uh, but we realized with the story map format, we weren't limited by you know the one hour, the one and a half, the two hours that the kids have. Um, one of the funny things that we're able to do with our field trips is we're able to get the schools out there essentially for free because the buses 
are available, but they have a very narrow window of time. Um, one of our goals is to really make it affordable to everybody, and we um, uh, we found that that's been extremely uh, popular and productive. But we never had the chance to sort of make a full day of it and say, oh, we're going to we're going to talk about beach ecology, then you'll have a lunch break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about horseshoe crabs. So the story maps really help to fulfill that. Let's just open up the horseshoe crab and bird migration story map. That's probably going to take a second to load, but uh, one of the other nice things that we were able to do, um, I've been photographing Plum Beach for 25 years now. Um, and so we were able to use a lot of our own proprietary photographs, but also we've been able to go and find photographs from uh, that have Creative Commons licenses uh, off of Wikipedia. And so for example, I was able to bring home uh, well, I mean, you know that I have this malt and I was able to photograph this malt at home uh, and include some of this, what normally would be hands-on, include this in our story maps. And then so as we continue to scroll down, we're basically telling a sort of a narrative story here. And this is all available on the hub um, for anybody, we kind of like the idea that it's 24 seven. Actually, if you look to the right of that, the one thing that we're trying to, to, that we've realized we have trouble with. So if you see down at the bottom of this, right where it says mouth, it says one of six. And if you look over the right, there'll be a right arrow. And then, so you can continue along. Sorry, Jonathan, I, I have all the Zoom windows open to you, so I can't. Uh, oh, yeah. Give it, did, you, did you want me to click somewhere? Oh, yeah, continue you can scrolling click over down. That right arrow. Uh, the, oh, that right arrow. Yeah. Yeah, we've realized we need to tell people a little better how to navigate this. So we're trying to include a little bit of a, a um, tutorial in our, in our homepage on this. But then you can continue to move along to the right, and it's kind of like a, a sidebar to the narrative flow that we have. Um, wow. And so kind of before we go to the next, and this is one of my personal favorites, um, you know, being able to show the kids the compound eyes. And we talk about how there's all these other eyes, but the compound eyes really get the kids' attentions, especially since they're very familiar with the idea of like flies eyes being compound eyes. We can talk about all the different lenses. It's, it's great to be able to have a compound lens that's that large uh, that we can actually do like a, a hands-on. And so from here, we can continue scrolling down to the bottom. <laughs> We've We've kind of, I mean, part of the feature of talking about the horseshoe crabs, especially when we're on the beach, um, of course, is the reproductive cycle. And we have a lot of younger classes. So we just sort of say, oh, the females are laying their eggs and the males are helping. So oh, this is still the red knot. I'm sorry, should I scroll? No, more? that's perfect. So yeah, we talk a lot about the red knot in this um, because it's one of those things that's very hard to do live. Uh, I hate talking about things that students can't see or touch. Um, and so I really appreciate the ability within the story maps to go in and you can see we're getting all of these images from Wikipedia Commons or from uh, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so we have all of these great sources that are licensed for um, public non-commercial use. And so we talk about these different species that are finding their way to the beach and talking about that, that kind of that amazing nexus of um, these birds coming up from South America and, and increasing their body mass 4% every day. Um, and then we are able to find these wonderful historical images. And then we can talk about the, the blue blood, which is another thing. Um, should I keep scrolling down? Yeah, we can keep scrolling down. The blue blood is so hard for students to imagine. We'd love to, you know, bleed them on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> to have one 
you know, lucky volunteer of a horseshoe crab. But, uh, you know, it's wonderful to be able to use these images within the story maps. This is our only real cheat image that didn't have anything. That image of the scientist, we really wanted to have something um, of, uh, of who was it, Kiefer, uh, Kiefer Hartline, who won the 1967 Nobel Prize regarding, um, you know, uh, the compound eyes of the horseshoe crabs, or we wanted to have something that was a good representation of the, um, the LAL acquisition process in the labs. We just couldn't find anything that was publicly accessible. So we just had this one little cheat of the generic scientist looking at a test tube, <laughs> which we got from the US FDA. We have some, some really great photo researchers and uh, ArcGIS folks on our team. So they were able to track that down. And then of course, you know, I, I, I have one of those horseshoe crab pins also, which is always fantastic. And I always love wearing that uh, to the beach when we do this. And we've actually had a couple of, um, of teachers who've been able to log in uh, to the Fish and Wildlife Service program and get one of these, one of the uh, little uh, certificate of participations for their class based on what they found while they're with us. And so actually, if we could jump back, well, we have this one thing, it's really interesting. If we keep scrolling down, you know, the ArcGIS programming is really all about mapping. And you'll notice for this story map, we didn't really have a lot of mapping. And so our, uh, our ArcGIS folks said, well, we really want to have a map in here. So we took, um, some of the, uh, the research locations uh, for horseshoe crab counts and we, we just map them out. So if you click on any of those boxes over on the left, uh, it jumps to a different monitoring location. So that was, our ArcGIS people were really like, we need to have a map in this. We can't just do this without a map. If we jump back, um, so if we go back up to the hub main page, sure. Uh, let's see, let's jump up to where it says coastal ecology. I think that'll get us back to our coastal ecology collection. Let's see if that's a live link. But it might be, um, uh, I have a lot of windows open on this computer, so it, it might also just be uh, slow, slow. Because on my side too, I apologize. Yeah, that's the, that's the one downside that we found with the ArcGIS system. Um, is that it is a little bit slow to load. I don't want to keep clicking it because then it'll only slow it down. Yeah, so one of the other subjects that we talk about for Plum Beach is we do address some of the coastal erosion and we talk about some of the infrastructure that's been built there and we talk about some of the potential alternatives. And again, I'm, I feel very lucky uh, to have been at Plum Beach for a couple of these different sort of milestone moments over the course of the last 25 years that I've been documenting the ecosystem there just for my own personal project. Um, but if you look at the satellite view, you can see some of the more recent Army Corps of Engineers uh, interventions that have taken place. And it's interesting, you can see that point um, that's been generated um, yeah, right by right behind the breakwater, which has created that really interesting uh, kind of shoreline shape. Um, it's doing its job. It's, you know, its primary job is to protect the Belt Parkway um, from nor'easters and hurricanes. And um, it's really interesting because like, once we get to that story map, we've got a video in there, which hopefully will load. Um, that demonstrate some of the beach replenishment that they were doing right around the time of Hurricane Sandy. Just prior to Hurricane Sandy, the shoreline was about at least 20 feet in from where you see it depicted on this satellite image. Um, and I actually have some photographs of uh, the Belt Parkway where you can pretty much see the water and the Belt Parkway 
uh, in a single non-wide angle, non-panorama view. It was really lapping right up at the edge of it. And the bike lane had been compromised, uh, which you can actually see just below the lower word of Belt Parkway, you can actually see that bike lane. And then all of that was uh, was replenished. Jonathan, I, it, I see, um, it, no, it's not allowing me to click on 01. There's a, it says 01 slash 05, would that Oh help? yeah, actually, if you could just go back to nych20hub.org and then we can take a look. Now, the other thing that we've been able to do in our pivot is to um, translate some of our, lessons and some of the ways that we like to teach on the beach or, or uh, at the reservoirs, our primary focus, and you'll notice as you look at the collections, which is sort of scrolling down the screen a little bit, you'll see some of our other collections do have to do with water infrastructure and the history of water supply to New York City. Um, so we do a lot of other work in terms of um, talking about different topics. So yeah, if you can click on that coastal ecology collection again. Sure, just give me a moment. Uh, sure, the Zoom you. windows, there's other windows in the way. <laughs> oh, I appreciate you, you navigating through this. I, uh, I had all of my windows set up and ready to share and I did not realize that the sharing might be an issue. Uh, my friend set up a guest account for me on his computer. So if you click on the Plum Beach, we can take a quick look at that and see how we kind of pivot and talk about slightly different subjects. We've also created virtual lessons that we do, again, for free, and the schools just sign up for that. Um, and we talk about some similar topics. So one of the lessons that I created is based on horseshoe crabs. Uh, and red knots. And it's a lesson plan that's geared towards younger students. So grades four through eight, for example. Um, and one of kind of the framework that we use is we introduce the students to um, this idea of wild places. Uh, and we remind them that although they might assume that wild places are like the rainforest or uh, you know, something like that, that we have all of these wonderful wild places all around New York City. And then we pivot from that conversation into an exploration of Plum Beach visually. And we say, does this look like a wild place? Oh, this feature is great. This is really what ArcGIS is so good at. If you look at the little arrows here in the center of this image, um, we can take a satellite view uh, and sort of translate it into a much older view prior to the Belt Parkway. So if you use that slider and you sort of pull that left and right, you can see how these wonderful things start to appear. Am I going too fast? Am I making you dizzy? No, that's perfect. <laughs> One of my favorite things that shows up just personally is the Coney Island Jockey Club down there in Sheepshead Bay <laughs> on the old map. And you can see how Plum Beach actually in this map is depicted, again, prior to the Belt Parkway, it's depicted as Plum Island. And you can actually see Hog Creek, which was the body of water that separated Plum Island from the rest of Brooklyn. So that's kind of fun. And we talk about how it was connected by Robert Moses, who else? None other than um, our master planner who created the Belt Parkway and intended for Plum Beach, now a beach, no longer an island, to be uh, in his initial plans for the Belt Parkway. Uh, he, he intended Plum Beach to be a stopover area. So from the very beginning of this roadway, this was meant to be a place that people experienced um, within his road-based infrastructure meant to experience as a natural place. So if we continue to scroll down, and I think I'm almost at my time, um, but I did wanna just mention that one of, the, one of the things that we think is a lot of fun is we take the students through, we introduce them to Plum Beach, we take them through a brief introduction uh, to 
uh, horseshoe crabs, a brief introduction to red knots, connect the two of them together with the red knot migration occurring uh, at exactly the time when horseshoe crab spawning is taking place, uh, and then ask the students to imagine a world where the horseshoe crabs and the red knots are both tech savvy and have smartphones and are either talking to each other. So the red knots are talking to the horseshoe crabs, the horseshoe crabs are talking to the red knots or talking within their groups uh, on TikTok. I, I'm trying to get the kids to enact a TikTok dance as a red knot or a TikTok dance as a horseshoe crab. They're getting close. I've had a couple of groups that have almost been there. Um, they far prefer to imagine, oh, this is some of the, the imagery that I was able to get. And so you can see the bike lane on the left here and the encroaching shoreline on the right. So all of these sandbags were placed there after a particularly bad nor'easter ate most of, of the beach at Plum Beach. And so that intervention by the Army Corps of Engineers was really pivotal. I, I argue that had they not intervened, had they not gotten the budget appropriations when they did uh, and been able to implement uh, that replenishment, that at least the southern half of the Belt Parkway would have been destroyed in Hurricane Sandy. Um, because you can see how close it, it, it really came. And we know the impact of Hurricane Sandy. I think that, that most of the, the eastbound Belt Parkway would have been undermined that day because that breakwater uh, I think did a lot. So we talk about in this story map, we talk about how one of the options would have been just steel, uh, a steel wall essentially. Uh, I went, we were able to go back and find that as one of the initial proposals. And we like to present that and we say, wh why is this you know, intervention of the groins and the breakwater, why is this preferable to a steel fence? Um, and we usually talk about that after we've discussed all of the different uh, members of the ecosystem at Plum Beach. And uh, we find that most students are able to make that connection pretty well, that with the steel wall, there's no beach, there's no, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's really no more ecosystem there. And we were able to get video of some of that beach replenishment happening. So we can show the students that. Um, but so that's how we actually pivoted during COVID to really translating into what we felt was a, a visually uh, robust and engaging um, way of interacting with students uh, through Zoom and online, um, whether it was the sort of 24-7 accessibility of the story maps, which we've really been working hard to push out uh, to our community of engaged teachers who've been working with us for the past um, seven and a half, eight years, uh, to being able to offer these live Zoom-based uh, class lessons that are really, we spent a lot of time creating them uh, so that they would be able to fit within that 40 minute window that we find most teachers are able um, to provide us. Great. And so I'm open for questions. I do apologize. Uh, I was sort of hoping that this would be a little smoother, but um, I thank you so much Beautiful. for thank you. helping out maybe, and scrolling through the hub. Maybe perhaps um, uh, folks have heard the website. Maybe you could post um, your website yeah, or email in the chat and uh, folks could continue any specific comments or directions that way. Um, Absolutely. Uh, because we're geared up uh, for Tom Green and Kingsborough Community College um, to uh, um, share some of their uh, recorded educational materials for us as well. Another way that us marine educators are working um, to keep education going in all these different platforms now. Maggie, I'm sorry, isn't Tom's thing at 1.30 and Godwin is right now? Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I was kind of nervous about the videos, so I was um, <laughs> you know, eager to go. You have another couple hours, but Godwin would like to start yeah. now. <laughs> okay, yes. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, uh, Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. I'm just finding Godwin to make you a, a co-host now, if you'd like to share anything. Unmute. All right. 
I don't know if anybody's switching in or out between sessions. So just, if anybody needs just a, a one minute break to get it, stand up, whatever, you know. Um, I'm going to be talking about hands on things. So I will tell you, I would love it if you would get a piece of paper, at least one piece of paper, scissors, and some tape if you happen to have it. I'm going to do some simple things, but that's my area of expertise is getting people using their hands and not just looking at a Zoom screen. So go ahead and get some paper tape and scissors. And oops, and I am going to, I don't know which screen I'm even sharing here. Uh, okay, there we go. So I can see what that is. Okay. Okay. If you guys are ready, I will. So um, what I'm I'm going to talk about something that's just more generic, um, and I'm I've included. I focused on bridges, uh, partly as a little play on words of uh, uh, the conference name, and then also um, because. M many waterways have bridges involved with them. Um, I'm just going to wait another minute or two. Does anybody else? I know that some of you have turned off your screens. So I just want to give you a second to see what I've got. Um, so I run a program in New York City. Sarah knows me and um, several people. I've been part of NISME for a long time. I'm part of NSTA. I always participate in the Marine Educator Session at NSTA. And I'm in New York City. I'm on the Upper West Side. I run a maker space. Here, let's go to the, oops. Let's go to my, there. So I run an informal education program on the Upper West Side. It's got, I've got, I actually have two physical spaces, one called Dazzling Discoveries and one called Skill Mill NYC. And Skill Mill NYC is a, a kind of a maker space open to the general public. So we do a lot of work with teachers. Um, we do everything from teachers come in for training, for learning how to use micro bits and 3D printers um, to class trips where we do activities. It's all hands-on. My whole world is focused on hands-on. And I've been able to take this Zoom world and make it interactive and hands-on. So our Dazzling Discovery space, it's a physical space on the Upper West Side, is aimed at elementary school kids. It's kind of like an elementary school classroom. Skill Mill is on Amsterdam Avenue between 106 and 107. It's a big storefront. You're welcome anytime. I love seeing people. Um, and then over the 20 plus years that I've been running these programs, and it's all science, hands-on, we work with hundreds of schools, work with hundreds of teachers, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've created some products. One is this cardboard engineering kit called Dazzlinks. And then the other one is engineering with paper, which is um, a methodology. We have I'm going to do my tiny sales pitch just right away. So, you know, you kind of get a sense of what I am. We have a lot of free downloadable projects on it, but we do also sell some of them and we created, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to just focus on my engineering with paper. So that's a quick overview of who I am and why I'm here. And I've been around for years and years. And uh, so, okay. So a lot of this engineering with paper came out of this basic idea that there are thousands of STEM challenges, Pinterest, uh, Instructables, like everywhere you go, you can find them. But what they tend to do is just assume that kids know how to do things. And because we only have 30 minutes, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. I usually do this as an hour presentation. Quick look, you can see, read what this says. But this is the challenge. What do you do when you wanna give kids any kind of challenge? There's a basic concept that kids will learn naturally. You give them the supplies, you give them the challenge, they'll figure it out. And that's either not true or teachers just don't have time. As you just said a few minutes ago, 40 minutes is what we have. 40 minutes, you can't, it's not really fair to expect them to figure out how to use the materials and how to deal with the challenge. So our premise is what we call level the playing field. 
if you teach kids how to use the materials, then give them the challenge, you're at least equalizing. You're not, because otherwise you wind up with these kids who come from parents who are architects and know and been building all their lives and they know what to do when you give them stuff. And then you have this group of kids who are like petrified. And those are the kids that really need your help. You know, they need to be given the skills. And those are the ones who will often say, I don't want to do it. Or, you know, then they don't, most of the time, I had this actually, we did a camp on Thursday, schools were closed, we had a camp day. And this kid goes, oh, I don't want to do this. And I said to him, I said, you don't want to do this because you don't know how to do this. And he goes, yeah. I said, great, I'm going to work with you on that. And, and it was just like, man, I just, I just, I just get reinforced on this concept constantly. So teach them some basics. So what are basics? In our case, it's paper and it's dealing with folding paper in different ways. That's our purpose. So this is all the material. This has been an amazing um, help to teachers in the past year, obviously, because they were home. Kids had these supplies. They could do hands-on. I have been able to engage. We did several sessions with 50, 80, 100 kids, all doing hands-on projects at home. I mean, these are school events. We were hired to do them. Um, I've been running my own classes with 20 kids. We get everybody building and they're not looking at the Zoom screen except, you know, once in a while, but they're building, they're working on stuff hands-on. These are the materials. This is an overview of some of the packets that we've created. Some of them are free. Some of them are $12. They're not, they're the cost of a book and you can use them for a whole class. But anyway, so you can see some patterns in here. There's, you should notice some simple shapes. Again, I'm going quickly because I, you know, I know you don't have a lot of time. Okay, so here, whoops, here are some examples of things and I'm gonna show you how to make some of these. They're all really simple. This is tracks. This is our track and cylinder, which we're also gonna use for the bridge. This is our catapult. It's a free download. And then the challenge was make something, make a way for the ball to come back. So we taught the kids how to make these shapes. Actually, I will show you in two minutes. And then we gave them a challenge. Here's another example, this is our creatures pack. But again, just keep looking. These are just folding paper in particular shapes. This is our axle project. This is, it happens to be the, this is the vertical axle. We have a horizontal axle also making windmills. All paper, tape, scissors. And the packets kind of give you this sort of the step-by-step -step about how to make the shapes. And then you let the kids do their own inventing once you give them the basics. Okay, so this is the track and the cylinder and that's basically what we're gonna use. And I'm gonna have you um, make this with me so that you know what we're doing. Um, so at, for, for the bridge project, we actually need to take a piece of paper and here's one of the ways that I do this. We're very literal and try to be as exact as possible with kids. Um, so we talk about um, longer and shorter sides of the paper. We don't use any other descriptions because you don't know that some people say a hamburger or hot dog fold. We don't use any of that because you don't know what cultural references the kids have. So we just stick to what you can see also just in the presentation where you say what kids can see, what you can show them, that's what you wanna work with. Take your piece of paper. And in this case, we're gonna fold it into thirds which means you kind of have to roll it. You can sort of measure it. You sort of eyeball it like that and then like that. So if everybody, if you try that, just kind of, you can sort of see it before you crease it, you just, you can just kind of eyeball it. With kids, often we do it in quarters because then it's folding in half. But for this particular bridge thing, it's a little easier to have it in thirds. So once you get, kind of approximate, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Then once you kind of figure out that third, 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 then squish it. So you're just taking, just taking a piece of paper and just kind of going, you know, eyeballing it, eyeballing it. You can usually line up the sides like I'm doing. It's a cylinder, you can see where it is. And then you wanna, then you wanna kind of squish that and then you're gonna cut it. So you don't even have to squish it tightly. It doesn't have to be a tight fold. It just has to be a, right. So now you've got three sections and then you want to cut that up. 
I'm giving you the really simple one page version of this. You could do this with three different pieces of paper. You could cut it in many different ways, but I'm just trying to give you the sort of a quick workshop version. So then take this and just cut it into three sections because we're just gonna, then we're gonna, gonna fold this. I'm gonna show you a couple of properties of this and then we'll look at the, and then I'll show you the projects that we've done. So on the, on the topic of bridges, one of the critical things is um, uh, strength of materials. So once you have strips of paper, this is, this is one of the first things that I do with kids is, you know, we, we do kind of notice that this is it's a little bit floppy, but depending on how old they are and how much you wanna show them, we show them this. And then we just take these two pieces and we just roll them into cylinders. That's all you're doing. These are the supports for the bridge. So this is where you'll need a little bit of tape. Um, I had somebody use tape off an Amazon box the other day because she didn't have any other tape. But you're just making cylinders and these are gonna be your supports. Sorry, we're making two cylinders or one cylinder? Two. 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 Right. That's just right, because you have three pieces of paper. We're making that one and then this one. Yeah, and definitely interrupt me. I, you know, I can't always, since I can't always see you, I don't always know what makes sense. So it depends how much material science you want to go into. Sometimes what I do is I have the students just make these cylinders. And I don't show them about, I save that floppy thing for later. You just have them make the cylinders, cut the paper, make the cylinders. And then I say, make a bridge. So basically what everybody does is, you know, they'll take this and just stick it on top of the, they'll just stick it on top of the uh, paper like that. And then if you take a pencil or anything. When I do this with kids, I often have um, blocks with me, but you do with pennies, do anything with a little bit of weight. As soon as you put a little bit of weight on, I didn't put my, as long as, you know, it, it falls apart. This piece won't, it won't hold up. And I'll show you some, I have a picture of it too, but so I, one of the ways that I do this with kids is I just, we cut the paper, we have them make the cylinders. I say, okay, now make a bridge. 99% of the kids will take this piece and put it on top. Then we put a weight on it, it will collapse. And I do this in school in real time, not just Zoom. I've been doing this project for years this way. So we can see that this isn't holding. So then we look and say, well, yeah, this is kind of floppy. So the magic of science and physics and materials is we wanna turn this floppy piece of paper into something sturdier. And this is how they make bridges. It's the same thing. They strengthen materials by folding, by bending it. So I-beams in construction are made this way. So if you take this same piece of paper and as you can see on my screen, oh, I forgot I was sharing it. So you, well, you can see it, that's what you want. You wanna fold, you've just got a little picture of me. You just wanna fold, your sides up just like in this picture. So, does that make sense? Should make, no, sorry. I actually meant to stop sharing to show you all of that and then go back. But anyway, this is what you're making. So has everybody got that? You can see immediately, right? Mm -hmm. It's significantly sturdier, just it doesn't flop. So then you take the same thing, put this on top of your two cylinders and you probably don't have a lot of weight with you right now, but I promise you, if you try this, do it with pennies or coins, you know, whatever you might have at home, you can hold um, significant amount of weight just by folding the paper's edges. The science behind this is that it actually compresses the atoms in the paper. And that is just like 
the difference between molecules, you know, liquids and solids, the more, the tighter they are, this makes them even tighter. So it's making a more compressed solid and that's what holds the weight. So this shape resting on two cylinders, you can pile, um, we do it with blocks, we do it with pennies, we do it with markers, you know, whatever I can, whatever we can, can find. I thought this is so cool. I just want to time check with you that um, we have five minutes left for presentation and then another five minutes for Q and A. So I it's about ten we minutes. Going, I was told we were going to eleven to uh, like I have ten more minutes, right? Yes. 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 Right. Okay. Um, and then there's lunch. So and I, you know, I'm okay staying a couple of minutes if you want to do that. So let me show you now uh, how we apply all of this. So that's the basic hands-on. And then this is that, the basic before you fold it piece. And then these are just kids building. So these are simple building structures. You can make uh, obviously an extended bridge. Um, we don't let the kids tape the track to the cylinders until they've done all the testing. And in this case, they haven't taped the track so much, they, they've taped the base. But we tried it, we don't want them taping anything because you lose the concept of, of strengthening the material. Um, this was a, I have a bunch of um, uh, lifting bridges and, but again, this is one of our project just examples where uh, we used cylinders, you can use rectangular prisms, it's the same concept, something important and just track. And all of these, pictures. There's a, another lifting one. This one we just, you can see we attached a string. I happen to have these funny little pink hand cranks that we used. You don't have to have that. You can just pull the string or they could design their own crank. I just had those and so we use them. Um, so these are all paper, tape, and scissors, different kinds of bridges, different models, ramps at the end. We teach kids how to make curves. This is a suspension bridge. I'm just showing you the levels you can go to with this. These are older kids. Um, part of what I always do is um, we usually start our bridge lesson by showing pictures of real bridges. I just put one in, but you well know how to, where to find dozens. There are many, obviously millions of bridge pictures around. So. Um, we look at just different types of bridges at the very beginning. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to show you the technique first. So this is a little out of order. This um, is a really great exhibit. It was at the um, Museum of the American Indian downtown at Wall Street. I don't know if this is still part of the exhibit. Um, I assume it was permanent. This is in, they have a children's room and they had this fabulous um, piece about building a rope bridge. So if you, Get to, if you go there or you take students there, it really was it really was great. It's just a small thing. And then here's the kids putting weights on on the bridges, building double deckers. You know, once they get the hang of that strengthening the paper, it really works. And again, that strengthening the paper is part of our catapult project. We use that same those two shapes, cylinders and track. We've got the catapult project is a free download on our website. Uh, I do have a bridge project, which I have not posted yet. That will be going up in the next, I don't know, hopefully next, but next week, which is a downloadable, how to do different kinds of bridges with paper. This is rolling paper into straws and building with that. Well, that's a whole other activity that we teach and it's a whole other workshop that I run, but I know that you can understand it just from this picture. Um, and just rolling paper straws and then building with them. Um, again, these are our packets. As I said, there's some free, otherwise they're, I think $6 to $20 for a packet. And you can use it for an entire class. Um, actually our build a playground one has the paper straws in it. This is my cardboard engineering kit that I sell. I remember 98% of my time is working with kids. I run in-person camps, I run teacher trainings. Um, I do workshops like this all the time. I just happen to have invented this and we sell it from our website where it's not on Amazon, it's only ours. 
but it's it's just been great. It's just cardboard with holes in it. And you can make all kinds of things. This is our skill mill space with kids building with it. Uh, we have beams and shapes. Uh, this is the shapes. And then this is our social media. So if you really wanna see what we're doing and get a good peek, please follow us. Engineering with paper on Instagram, all kinds of projects you can. And we're happy if you can look at this and figure out how to do it yourself and use it, great. Our purpose is not, we're not making money on this. We're trying to get this methodology out there because it's so accessible. And it's great when you go back to the, you know, back in the classroom, it just makes, it makes building easier. You don't need to get all these special supplies. Um, Are you open for some questions now? Yep. That's it's it. Perfect timing. No, no, no rush. If, if there's something no, we want it. to share more, but um, uh, do folks have uh, comments or questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself. I love it. Got it. Okay. I um, love, love, love. Look, I got mine here. <laughs> Yeah, and then we make the kids separate them. Like you can make, the, and again, depending on the size of paper, you can make them longer, but you have to, you know, they like sometimes they'll crunch them up because they have to space under the bridge to show how it works. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I think the point you made at the start about how um, giving uh, children time with the materials before they're supposed to learn from them um, is a, a critical piece for hands on education at times. It I wonder if anyone else has experience with that as well. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Um, yeah, and I don't know what, what grades you teach and, you know, what would be helpful. I know. You know, and, even when we're um, water testing sometimes and the kids are just like splashing their hands in the bucket, I'm like, give them a few minutes you know, let them experience the material in a freeform way first. And, and um, you could see sometimes um, nervousness in some of the adults, like, aren't we supposed to be doing something with this? You know, and um, I'm really glad to be part of a cohort of educators um, that can still draw on the kind of wonder and connection you can make with hands-on materials. Right. Like you all. <laughs> so. But we do find it's really important to just teach them some of these basic things. And just like I showed you, I don't know how many of you would have known this before. Did anybody ever do anything like this? You guys can just raise your hands. I don't know. Sort of. Because this is not, people don't think about it. They just don't. And the other comment I get a lot is that, oh, we work with cardboard all the time. We never thought to use paper. So, you know, so I just get a kick out of that one. But um but paper is amazing. It's the most versatile thing. You can, it, you know, it, it, it can be a fabric like soft material or it can be a, a rigid. And this is what they do when they make buildings. They make I-beams exa for exactly the same reason. So, you know, it's just a whole structural engineering concept. Amazing. And thank you for, I know you put your um, info on one of your screen, but if you'd like to chat it, that way folks could have it. And I'm sure the... Um, Info shared today will be made available um, through NISMIA's website as well um, uh, in the future. Um, That's so, my email address. Yeah. And the website is dazzlingdiscoveries.com, which is in my email address. And um, as we wrap up, I'd like to also add, I'm gonna chat in a link to a free professional development on the waterfront. Um, there's two cohorts. One will be meeting in Staten Island and one will be meeting in uh, Brooklyn. You don't have to live there or teach there um, to join us. Those are just the locations. Um, but at, Jake and I are also um, leading some professional developments on coastal resilience and restoration, bringing together a bunch of these ideas, like you're saying, but with, God, with materials and also um, what Jonathan was saying about how the waterfront is getting resilience treatments that could be hard or soft. We'll be looking at some of those in person um, as well. And I believe Jonathan's links are already in the chat as well. Uh, so there's lots of information available for uh, to help us all continue to improve our practice and, and also really um, keep marine education an important part of what happens for the youth of our urban estuary.
For sure. So. I know. So we're right about the ending time, but I, I um, if anyone else would like to contribute a suggestion or a, another project to share, we could take a quick few seconds for that. You're good. Yeah, we're good. All right. And I believe we're at our lunch break now. And for the next um, Zoom part of the NISMIA annual conference, um, we'll be meeting back in the link for the main room. Uh, am I right about that? I, I might not be right about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what? It's the link for the main room. Oh, no, this link will be live. That's right. Um, the main room link will be live for the Minds On session. And this link will be live for the um, uh, the next sessions as well. Um, so just check your agenda for the proper links. That's what I should have said. All right, and I'm just gonna say one more time to check, sign up for our Instagram under engineering with paper, actually all of our dazzling discoveries, skill mill dazzlings, we have Instagrams on all of them, but if just to understand this, how to use paper in all kinds of ways, that would be the best place to, to see it. All right. Thank you to all of our participants who uh, it's got hands on with us today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. See you after lunch. <laughs>